e nā mana, e nā reo, e nā karangatanga maha. Tēnā tātou katoa. No mai ke tēnē, kōrero whakahirahira. A warm welcome to all of you here this evening. Thank you for joining us on the opening night of Local History Week and Heritage Month. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the exit is where you came in. And if you do need to um, use the restroom while you're here, they're at the very end out to your right, at the very end of the hall after the stairs. This panel on history and the built environment in and around Palmerston North has been eagerly anticipated, in, um, given the calibre and the knowledge of the panellists. We are fortunate to have as our chair, Jeff Watson, Associate Professor, School of Humanities, Massey University. Jeff, a true local, national and international historian, is outstanding in the field of sports history. He has co-edited and written for various books, journals and magazines. And you may have read some of his articles in the back issue series of the Manawatu Standard. In 2022, he won the Palmerston North Heritage Trust Local Historian of the Year. <laughs> And uh, just a, a wee plug, um, Jeff also features later in the week as he guides a walk through Memorial Park. That's Tuesday at 1.30 tomorrow. <laughs> bring your togs, okay, bring your togs. Uh, it is my pleasure to hand over to your chair for this evening, Jeff Watson. Kirikoto and welcome again to this evening's panel discussion on the history of the built environment uh, in and around uh, Pamutana. Uh, this is a very uh, topical issue and uh, very much looking forward to hearing the perspectives of our panellists on this. I uh, think it appropriate to begin with a couple of acknowledgements. Uh, very much like to thank Tracy for your introduction and your team for organising Local History Week. I think uh, you know, there's never been a better time to be a local historian, uh, and there's never you know, been a better place to be a local historian than Palmerston North. I think we're uniquely lucky in the collections we have, both what's electronically available on papers past, but uh, thanks to those who've gone before us, like Ian Matheson, the community archives we have, as well as the council archives. And uh, it's because of the efforts of many people and the team on Manawatu Heritage and making so much of that uh, available to people that um, Palmerstonians are able to uh, access uh, our, our history. And so I think uh, it's appropriate to begin by acknowledging that. Um, I'd like to acknowledge also the very supportive uh, stance taken on heritage by uh, our Mayor Grant Smith and the Palmerston North City Council. I'd uh, also like to acknowledge one or two people's radio who are here recording this this evening. And I understand the recording uh, from tonight will be made available in due course on one or two heritage. Uh, and uh, uh, so it will be available uh, after we've concluded tonight. And I think it's also appropriate to acknowledge some of the recorders of local history who um, we draw upon at various times. Uh, the Manawatu Standard uh, and uh, Janine Rankin's work there, and Judith Lacey from the Tribune, who's uh, been a very enthusiastic promoter of heritage and, and history issues locally. So uh, we're, we're very lucky to have those people around, and we're very lucky to have our three presenters tonight. So we have uh, Warren Warbrick, who will begin by presenting a Rangitane perspective on the topic. Uh, Cindy Lilburn will then talk about how heritage is shaped uh, urban planning of Palm Minister North and Mike Roche will provide a historical geographer's perspective uh, on the development of the, our built environment. And so after our speakers have finished, uh, we'll then open up for your questions. So we are very fortunate indeed uh, to have three eminently knowledgeable panellists and collectively they bring well over a century of expertise uh, to the to this topic. So our first uh, speaker, Warren, brings literally a lifetime of accumulated knowledge uh, and practice. 
is presently, and uh, among many other things, uh, Tohanga Whakairo of Rangitane Ki Manawatu. And his work in this capacity can be seen in and around our city, uh, indeed in this very building. And for those of you, if you've walked here uh, by a square edge and you saw the patterned uh, crossing there the, and the uh, patterning on the roundabout, that's uh, just one ex of the many examples of Warren's work which are physically part uh, of our uh, built environment now. Uh, in the words of uh, John Bevan Ford, uh, the e eminent uh, Māori and Ngāti Kaufata carver and, and artist, Warren has been a pioneer in the research into old rangitane ki manotu styles and techniques, and is continuously looking for opportunities to retranslate those styles into 21st century forms. And uh, he's also a leading historian of our region. Um, as part of Toy Warbrick, he's taken the story of Palmerston North to the international as well as local stage with the play Cornell Song Cycle of a New Town, which is an interpretive history of the origins of Palmerston North. Uh, in 2021, Toy Warbrook were awarded local historian from the, of the year from the Palmerston North Heritage Trust uh, in recognition of the innovative uh, presentations of the history of our Rohi. And in the citation, uh, Margaret Tennant noted that hearing Warren talk in place about the sites that have meaning for him and his tipuna can be a transformative experience, one where stories are shared with humour, generosity and grace. And uh, I'm sure we'll uh, see that this evening and look forward to it. So our second speaker is Cindy Lilburn, and many of you will know Cindy in her professional capacity as Collections Manor Manager at Te Manawa, uh, and its previous incarnation, the Manawatu Museum. Uh, indeed, in 2022, uh, Cindy celebrated her Ruby anniversary, uh, 40 years of employment, um, with the various uh, uh, incarnations of the Manawatu Museum now Te Manawa. And her professional experience is complemented by more than four decades of committed advocacy for our region's heritage. Uh, she's Chair of Historic Places, Manawatu in Horafenua, and a long-serving member of the Palmerston North Heritage Trust. And in an informal and uh, mostly unpaid sense, uh, Cindy's also been a historical consultant um, for many on account of her encyclopedic knowledge of our local history. Indeed, what Cindy doesn't know about our local buildings probably isn't worth knowing. So, you know, we really are very lucky there. Um, in 2018, her contribution to our heritage was recognised in a special award by the Palmerston North Heritage Trust. And the citation aptly noted, Cindy Lilburn has devoted her life to the heritage of our region and has done so without any sense of self-aggrandisement for more than 30 years. Her dedication underlines the value of those who acquire a depth of knowledge and sense of place over many years. Individuals like Cindy are community treasures. Uh, so uh, we're lucky to have uh, Cindy talking to us about uh, some of our local places. And our final presenter is Mike Roche, uh, Emeritus Professor of Geography at Massey University. Um, this is not 2023, is in some ways something of an anniversary because it's 40 years since Mike began at Massey in 1983. And uh, Mike's a historical geographer with an interest in landscape change, which provides a link to both built environments and local history. Uh, he contributed, among other writings, a chapter to City at the Centre on the environmental history of Palmerston North. And he's written about uh, aspects of Palmerston North's built environment, including the railway houses at Milson, the workers' dwelling houses at Terrace End, our Puni soldier settlement, the Esplanade, and Anzac Day. Um, he was awarded the New Zealand Geographical Society Distinguished Geographer Medal in 2010, which is the highest award uh, offered by the society. And in 2017, was awarded a Doctor of Literature by Massey University uh, in recognition of his outstanding contribution to scholarship in the field. So uh, we're very lucky to have our panellists uh, with us this evening. Uh, very much looking forward to hearing uh, what they have to say and, and to your questions. So I'll now hand over to Warren, our first speaker. Hmm. 
Gautam. Now, Rangitani point of view is kind of interesting because um, if you look around the environment today, there is really very little left of what we had as a built environment. So I'm going to show you a map. Uh, this map is the um, Tiahua or Tūranga um, map done by JT Stewart. And um, this was drawn up for the sale of that block in 1864. And I'm going to go a little bit more, well, quite a bit further back from that. So as a people, we arrived here um, by uh, our ancestor, Whātonga. And Whātonga had two wives, but also he had a number of children. Um, but the one we want to sort of look at is, his name is Totuki. Totuki had a child and that child was called Tane Nui Arangi. So Tane Nui Arangi is the person to whom we as Rangitane all descend from. We all refer to ourselves as Rangitane, but our actual name is Tane Nui Arangi. Okay. So when Whātonga brought us into this area, one of the things that he mostly noticed is that the environment was an environment that offered us everything that we needed to, to have to survive, not just in its land formations, but in the rivers, the streams, all of the lagoons, the swamps, everything was full and teeming with the food that we needed. Before us, there was um, another group called uh, um, Ngāti Māmoe, and we must remember that Ngāti Māmoe were here first. And um, we, um, over time, kind of overrun them. In a sense, I don't really want to go into all of that, but um, we became, if you like, the dominant force here and still are today. Now, you can see along here that where the river is moving from the gorge. There's a little wee island in the middle of the gorge. You all know who that is? No? Sometimes it's called Rabbit Island today, but it's actually called Parahaki Island. The days of old, um, our ancestor uh, Te Awe Awe, he once lived on that island from time to time. That was a strategic point. You've got to remember, everything on that map is about being strategic. So the island, you can see, if you're on that island, you can see right in, up into the gorge. The only way from the other side, or the west, sorry, from the east, to come in here easy, you had to come through the river, you had to come through the gorge. It was a gateway. So if you had the island, you were able to monitor who was coming and going. So it was strategic. If there were people coming in from that area, the old fellow would light um, fires, which will alert those at Okofutu and also at Otoa, and it will alert them to be ready for an invasion. Okay. So Potua, do you all know Potua? Potua is um, commonly known nowadays as Port Shop Hill. And when I put Shop Hill or um, to our military folk, it's called uh, Anzac Park. Up there, I guess in terms of a built environment, that is probably our most strongest one because it was one of the highest peaks. And you could see, if you if you go up there, you can see right out towards Te Ahua Tūranga, the, um, the old mauna there, and right to the gorge, if you go around a bit towards the massy end of it, you can see right along to what we know of as Turutia. Has anyone seen the, the new platform placed up in Turutia? Yes, yeah, so Turutia also was a, um, a built environment, if you like. So all of these, if you, you've got to kind of think about that environment in the way we used it to survive. So... We all know where, um, on the Massey side, uh, where the DSIR is. It's not called that anymore, but it's 
part of Massey. That area was once called Mukumuku, and there was a big pass site there. What's the remnants of that pass site today is where Karaka Grove is. And they are the remnant of the large forest of Karaka that once grew there. Karaka is a, is a, a food source to which we totally relied on. And if you um, prepared it correctly and dried it, it was a food source for us over the winter. And also it was a, um, um, what do you call it? A protein, it was a protein through, through this nut. So as you know, the river floods in that area and we had villages in that area. Those villages that were on the flat area, such as, um, I'm just going to point at the map. That ridge pretty pop up quite high, up All of this area used for cultivating and collecting food during the summer. And in the summer period, that food would be collected and taken up onto those pass sites and stored for the winter. And when winter arrived, that whole area on the flatlands would. would turn into floodlands and the people would then retreat to those higher areas or those built areas and they would spend the winter period there. And when the summer came, they retreated back to those flatlands because once the water was uh, moved away, the land was then fertile enough to replant and then start again. Does that, does that make sense? But also the floods were really important because they also filled all of the swamps and lagoons with water and replenished all of that area as well. So we had eels, all sorts of things like that. Um, you've got to also remember that the environment we had then was really thick with bush. The bush was um, another food source. I guess you already kind of understand that. I don't want to go into those sorts of details. But the important for us was those built up areas. So Potor was one of those. Sadly, over over time through the, um, the development of the Palmerston North, Potor had changed in many, many ways, especially after the sale of um, the Te Ahua Tūranga block. And um, it went under, um, I guess, not under the borough council, but it was under like a district council at one stage. And they totally cleared off about um, a height of about seven metres of land to build the road that we know as uh, Summerhill Drive. It'd be nice to actually change the name to Potor Drive, Potor Street. Most of it's right there. Um, and sadly, it took away a lot of archaeological information as well, which was quite valuable. So our people once lived up there. Um, it is believed that J.T. Stewart was taken there by Huruwanu Kai Mokopuna uh, during the 1850s. Um, and this, this is Huruwanu Kai Mokopuna. And when I talk about the sale of the Te Ahua Tūranga block, he was the one that negotiated that. And that sale was about not just selling the land, but bringing um, uh, settlers here. Our people have a different history here. We wanted settlers here. I'm not saying that the sale was a, a perfect sale because there were issues, like in any form of sale, really. But the intention was to have um, settlers here. And he was a main instigator. Everyone goes on about Petty doing it. He was a part of it, but this is the main man. And he was paramount. And in terms of built environment, this is the only real image of a built um, whare. This is Hiruanu's whare. This was at Ashus. It was called Rokoa Pa. And at Rokoa Pa is where that sale was, was signed and negotiated. And we don't have any early 
um, evidence of what our whare or, or what our villages were like, other than some um, images of Puki Totara Pa, which um, we seem to think they could be a little bit dubious. Everyone know Carl Sim? Yeah. yeah. Now known as CF Goldie? Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, I'll say no more. <laughs> um, yeah. So, So we don't we don't really have a lot of our early um, evidence left. All we have really is landforms, and we know what happened on those landforms. We know that those past sites were also palisaded; they were fortified. Um, they were there for um, protection of our people, and this here. This is a great image, actually. Uh, this is, I think, probably one of the better images of Potor, and it's at the time where I think the land hadn't been taken off the top of it. And you can see how how tall it was. And if you can imagine that, with all of the uh, palisading that went all around that, the the immenseness of it, um, it would have had a very very strong presence. Um, over to one side, you can see um, a lower straight cliff face, which is still there today. There's a lot of houses being built on that. Um, according to my great aunt, or great great aunt, um, she stated that there was villages along those cliff faces as well. So it wasn't just on that one spot. It was it was quite vast and quite spread out. And um, and today we have an agreement this, uh, between ourselves as Rangitani and the City Council with the idea that we will look at um, a redevelopment up on top of Potor. And um, I can't really talk too much about that, but um, yeah, keep your eyes on that one. Um, yeah, it's a shame that it's been all taken down. But um, what we're doing today, especially in, in partnership with Council, is re-looking at our histories and um, what once was there, and alongside Council, um, looking at redeveloping those for the benefit of our um, um, maintenance of our histories, but also to share our histories with the wider public. So we have um, um, what we're going to be doing up on POTOR, because that's going to be not just about us as Rangitani, that's about everyone, it's about, it's more of a civic concept. Uh, we have um, Turutia, um, celebrating not just ourselves as Rangitani and our partnerships with um, um, Council in terms of building that, but also recognising other iwi that came here, such as um, Upuka Ere, who who actually were the last ones to live on that site. Um, also looking at one of the sites on the, the, the flatland, such as Ahimati, and um, redeveloping that. that. That one's almost complete. And in the future, we're looking at another site just up the river a little bit, um, sadly quite close to the tip, um, is Marae Tarata, and we in the future are looking at redeveloping that area as well. And for us as Rangitani, one, we want to remember these spaces, but two, we want to share these spaces. We don't want it just to be all about us, it's about all of us, such as the River Framework is about the same concept. Um, and in terms of that, there's a lot of other work that we're doing to try and recognise um, some of the people that were important in history as well, and developing parts of infrastructure to to show that. Does everyone know the clock tower? Yep, the Arnold clock tower. Yep, the clock tower is really interesting because the clock itself actually came from um, the post office. And when it was first put up on the post office, um, um, one of the borough council members who also became um, a politician 
his wife dedicated the bells and, and the, the clock faces to a chief of ours by the name of Kere Tapano. Now, Kere Tapano, when we see that clock, even though it runs late, the time's not always right, um, <laughs> um, we've got to remember when it was dedicated to him, he was 103 years old. And we kind of think of the clock as being him. So you kind of have to be kind of graceful about his age. <laughs> But Kere Tapano was also, um, he had two wives. His second wife was Erene Te Aweawe. Now, Erene was the sister to Te Pete Te Aweawe. And if you kind of think of a built-up piece of um, structure, well, Pete's one of those. He's a statue standing in Tamarai Ohene. But to kind of sort of recognise one of our rangitāne wahine tō, or woman of strength, um, we looked at reuniting Kere Tapano with Erini. So keep an eye on the base of the clock tower. They've just put in all the concrete area, and hopefully um, it'll end up looking like this. So um, our, man, our man Holmes, the artist, he did this picture of Erini, and... I said to him when he first showed it to me um, in the mayor's office, I said, um, is it right if I take a picture of the base of that cloak? And he goes, oh, why? I mean, you might see it in the future somewhere <laughs> as an artwork. And, um, and so there it is. I would have done this, abstracted it and flipped it to create her kākahu underneath her husband right there. But hopefully in the next month or so, that'll start to appear. So we're trying to do things like that. Now, this here, will, this pattern also links to another one that's going to appear up at Massey University as well, in their library. I've got to be careful here because I can talk and talk and go on and on and on for ages. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so I've used these types of patterns to link particular Rangitane sites. And um, there's two of them up at Massey. One is the vet school, one is the library, there's an, which are yet to be done. Um, there's also um, Te Ahua Tūranga uh, Highway. Um, I've been doing a whole lot of work on that alongside um, Sandy Adset. And um, we've been using these forms to, to show the mana of the whenua and also the stories of our people. And also, um, uh, more recently, the... Um, the work on arena on phase one also links back to this point here, to the central part of our city. And um, I'll stop there because I'll, I'll go on and on and on and on, and these guys won't get to talk and we'll get hungry. <laughs> Delta. Thank you very much, Ron, and there will be an opportunity for you to um, ask more questions later. Uh, uh, Cindy, I'm thinking. Um, which way forward for the slides? Um, that one answers you forward. It brings you back, and if you want to point to stand. Okay. That was orange when I started. <laughs> Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. Um, my theme is looking at taking it from the Maori into the European settlement from the beginnings in Palmerston North um, to give you some idea of how the European heritage that people brought with them and um, has since um, also through the media and and learning has um, influenced the way in which our city has been laid out. So looking at how European ideas and aspirations have set the urban planning of the city. So pardon the comparison, but like religion, I feel urban planning is an attempt to do two things, is try to create some sense to the world and the space around you, trying to bring order. And the other way is it's trying to bring a way to live in, with others in this world in harmony through how you space things out. 
So Warren's talked about the space before European settlement, the world that um, faced the first European settlers to this town, this area, was forest. This is a slide of um, a bush scene by a local painter. Um, deep, dense forest. The Manawatu area was settled in the 1850s, 1860s and 1870s. Uh, later than most other places in New Zealand, so there were already thriving towns uh, from the 1840s at Auckland, Wellington, Nelson, Whanganui and New Plymouth, but they had the benefit of being coastal ports and having open land or open country, basically grass, which looked easy enough to clear and use. Uh, the inland part of Manawatu, once you get, uh, and there was only one, two ports, uh, Port Rangitiki and uh, Foxton. Once you get past the sand dunes, which run to about halfway across the bandwidth, if you want to call it, of this um, region, you're into heavy, dense forest. And so Palmerston North was founded in a clearing of about 500 acres. I never got the, the full sizing. Um, but it could only be entered by a very narrow path, oops, which came in, which came in via Fitzroy um, Street off the bend there uh, in the river. People would come out of the canoe, having travelled in the canoes, having travelled up, and then walk up through a narrow um, pathway cleared from Fitzroy uh, Bend up into the clearing that existed. And we sometimes forget, and in fact, often do, how small that clearing was. If you can see sort of in the diagram, at one corner, one corner was Cook Street in Cuba, roughly where the showgrounds were. The other corner was up Rangitiki Street as far as Featherston, and another corner was down as far as the corner of Ferguson and Fitzherbert, and then running out to Terrace End. So you're looking at maybe six blocks worth um, from north to south, as you could say. And I ought to also point out that you'll see that there's two areas. Um, there's the uh, native reserve down in the bend of the river there, which falls outside that um, clearing. And that was the land that was set aside for Rangitani by their agreement as their um, previous settlement site when they sold the land to European settlers. Um, so it sort of falls outside the sort of the world that was going to become our settlers. And most of the natural features, which is the Centennial Lagoon as we know it now, and the other lagoons, and you'll see the Mangoni Stream also outside that um, block of um, land, which is that clearing. So if um, a historical geographer might like to comment later, it meant that uh, they were looking at something which was essentially featureless for them, and also a very alien environment. Um, the space, um, as you saw in that Atwood slide, was uh, surrounded by trees that were dense bush up to 20 metres high. Uh, and given the small size of that clearing, as you're looking across one side to the other, it must have felt incredibly claustrophobic to British people, many of whom, of course, have come from places that have been very long settled, in which there were very few forests left for them. Um, so, and the other aspect to that, Warren talked about how people, Māori, use the forest for resources. It was not something that um, Europeans may have seen obviously to them. So, when they arrived to try and make sense of this new world, um, one of the aspects of that plan, and it, it's... Um, may not be obvious, is that the settlement's drawn so that the square is the centre of one mile radius. So it's one mile along Main Street to Botanical Road, and it's one mile along Rangitiki Street up to Boundary Road, which is we now know as Tremaine. So if you imagine a big circle like that. Um, so it was planned by a man called John Tiffin Stewart, Warren's mentioned him, who'd come from South Australia, uh, where the planning style there 
from the 1830s onward was the grid and the square. In fact, I understand Adelaide has six squares scattered through its central city. And so he designed it with the grid and the square, something he was familiar with and which was also familiar in, in Western culture. They've been using grid planning since ancient Greek and Roman times through to medieval and up until um, the relay, the um, reconstruction of Paris in the 1860s and 70s. So, uh, and I have to say that John Tiffin Stewart also designed fielding, which if you look at the plan is of course a diamond with the um, grid pattern turned on an angle. So everything meets in a sort of a, at a, angle with not one but two squares he put into that although you probably don't know particularly notice the second square in fielding so the whole point of using a grid design it gives you instant order to an untouched landscape or as we say in palmerston north you go boys high as you go three blocks along rangitiki street then you turn left one block so directions inside the central city are pretty easy you count this way and then you count that way and it's also easier to subdivide rectangular blocks of land. And in New Zealand and Australia, they had something which they called town acres, which is that people were offered the opportunity to purchase an acre of land in town plus a certain amount of acreage outside town, 40, 20, 40 acres uh, with one acre in town as their incentive in the 1840s and onwards. Um, and of course, that enabled you to become a property owner. And of course, it also made it easier in rectangular blocks to just slice sections up further and further. So um, one little aspect of this town's urban design, which isn't found elsewhere, I've noted, which is also a result of the forests here. Um, our Palmerston North and Manawatu road names, you'll notice that this region has lines instead of roads in many places. Uh, such as Rangitiki Line, and that's because that's where the surveyors, of course, pegged out straight cuts through the bush to go from one point, from point A to B, um, with minimal um, <laughs> minimal diversion. Um, and the first one of that, one of our earliest lines, is Pioneer Highway, which was the one that we built out in 1875 to become our link to the outside world to Foxton. So as for the square, which was the other element of the design, um, I'm not quite sure what John Tiffin Stewart, the planner, had in mind when he created it. Um, it was, of course, a barren 17 acres worth of windswept paddock for many years. Um, however, um, I'd also note that the way the square has been redeveloped over the years, the changes to it, its subdivision that's bringing the areas together, also says something about um, the tastes of the time. So it's gone from being windswept to um, neatly ordered and closed boxed in, and now it's been reopened up again with the current plan that was done in the 1990s because they it's laid out on, on um, pathways between what they considered important. Um, so as I said, the first 20 years it was windswept. It was, um, uh, you'd wonder why it existed because people had to walk their way around it or plod across the mud and grass. But then suddenly in the 1900s, you get a burst of beautification of the square and you get um, hedges, gardens and the lakelet added. And that's because I feel Palmerstonians must have decided that their settlement had survived and thrived and it was now a proper town and a proper town needed a proper park. Um, and that is true. Um, I'll just note two little things. Firstly, the town doubled in population over the 1900s. It went from 5,000 people to 10,000 people by 1910. And the other thing, as I always say, that was the decade when it went from wood to brick. Um, the city council brought in an ordinance or the borough council brought in an ordinance that people were not allowed to build wood due to the fact that it did tend to burn down quite well. Um, and so everything in the CBD had to be built in brick. Now, of course, that brick is the unreinforced masonry buildings that are our earthquake risk. 
that we quite have avoided if we'd stuck with the wood, but never mind. Um, so it became a public park. You know, it had box, it had little box hedges, planting, and various memorials. And at some point, I think it crossed over. It's become our our sacred space, is how I see it. Um, it holds a lot of our town's memorials. If you want a memorial, it should be going in the square. And by 1923, it was sufficiently our sacred space that when they built the war memorial, it had to go at the exact centre. So they had to negotiate with the um, New Zealand Railway to actually bend the railway around the um, war memorial. Exact centre was important to them. So other than the ladies' rest, there hasn't actually been any buildings that have managed to lodge themselves in the square. Um, We've fought off various options, and only the city council chambers has managed to nibble its way into one corner. But um, yes, I, I came from um, the museum, of course, and there was a proposal to build the museum building in the centre, but it didn't it didn't um, didn't make it. In the 1990s, of course, I've got to note that there was also one quadrant has been rededicated in 1990, the 150th um, since Captain Cook. Um, as to Mariah Hine, uh, using the original Maori name that had been gifted to the square, but it's not really actively used by um, Maori, and it it's too has become just a place with memorial carvings. But as I said, the place to go, if you want to put a memorial, it is our place for, I guess, our secular ritual centre. So the next part, I just have to comment about the growth of the suburbs since the 1950s. So when you're looking at the 1870s, Palmerston North was built as a walking town. Um, most people were what they call carriage folk, which meant you had to be you had to be rich enough to maintain a horse, a stable, and a carriage, and feed that horse for a whole year. So people did expect to walk to their work, um, and people would walk up to an hour, sometimes more. Um, if they had to. Then you get the crossover about the 1920s. If you look at postcards, you'll start seeing that there's almost as many cars in the street and buses as there are horse-drawn vehicles. And by the time you get to post-World War II, um, you have soldiers returning from the World War II um, and the so-called baby boom, people marrying um, and wanting to set up families and Palmerston North doubled in size, and we have the addition of all the suburbs that have um, grown around the um, around Palmerston North um, borders of botanical Ruahine um, boundary, and then back down towards the river. Um, up to this point, you'll find that people were just taking those big empty sections that had been part of the city, and were starting to subdivide them down into quarter acres. So the suburban style is based upon a new culture of urban planning, and it's based around the car. And so in the USA, they started to worry about long straight grid roads, which just made it possible for people to hoon down them in those new motor vehicles um, at top speed, whatever that speed was back in the 1920s. Um, so they started planning suburbs that were sort of like super blocks, where you've got crescents and cul-de-sacs inside them, but no through road for rat races, and building the essentials, um, such as shops, to the outside. And that's 1920s thinking. And at the same time, you've also got 1900s um, garden cities, where the concept was of building new, new cities that provided all the services you would need um, in a more pleasant, spread out environment which also was parks, shops, and schools. And that philosophy came to its fruition in its first um, iteration as Savage Crescent, which was built over 1938 to 1945. And it was the Labour government's turn at building what they thought was a model suburb in a, in a block, in a very neatly subscribed, um, circumscribed block with, as you can see, a park at the centre, um, cul-de-sacs with walkways through, 
so that you could take your bike through and walk out onto the main highways, but the traffic didn't have any cause. And yes, communal garages, which no longer exist, and lots of traffic islands, little places for planting. Of course, the other aspect of that is that New Zealanders have long had this idea of a, a standalone home as their ideal, coming as they have from um, the very crowded urban areas of Britain in the, 19, in the um, Victorian era. And so uh, Professor Paul Spoonley says, you came and got a parcel of land as part of your dream of coming to New Zealand. A quarter acre was a piece of land on which you could build a house and feed yourself with a garden and possibly a cow. A small piece of land, well, and chooks, and the veggie, yes. A small piece of land that enables you to live quite well. Uh, and, I, you know, um, it might be my own generation, but you might have to consider whether or not you might be buying into that dream when you mutter about infill housing. So... I would like to point to some, should I say, worrying or interesting trends. Um, so the first one, uh, let me see, the modern suburbs of the 2000s with no hearts. Um, I have workmates who live out at places called Brooklyn Heights and developments along Robert's Line and James Line, um, Napier Road, and all of those have long lines of streets with no shops or parks within walkable distance to relieve the monotony. And all the essential services, supermarkets and schools, can only be reached by using your car. I mean, I, I, try, I went round and round that plan of Brooklyn Heights trying to find a shop <laughs> or something, um, and it was pretty barren. Um, and then we have um, what is tactfully known as McMansions, an American invention. Um, or as someone said, trophy houses, giving the middle class the feeling that they've moved up to be upper class. Um, so double garages, open plan living, multiple bathrooms, including an ensuite, uh, great rooms and family rooms. So in New Zealand, um, they can reach as much as 225 square metres. My own house is 60 with a bit to make, with a garage to make it 90. Um, <laughs> and that's actually some of the largest in the world as a sort of standard house. And I've put the one on the left just to show you, that's a, um, a plan of a section of mansions, um, just to show you how much of the block, the section they occupy. Um, when they're, yes, as they're built. But for those who feel life is too big, there is the, and you know the song, it has the word ticky tacky in front of it, little boxes. <laughs> so um, these are the new ones, um, which are standalone houses. And that probably is their selling point. But under the current law, all they need is one metre to the side fence. And that's not even counting the eaves in. It's one metre from the, um, the footings to the side fence. Um, the only requirement is that the main bedroom and the living room are not on the one metre side, which means you can have any bathroom and any other bedroom and office space on the side where you've got only one metre for the fence. Um, my, do the developers create them because the market wants them? Or is it because the government planning rules currently permit it? Fortress homes. Fortress homes. This is out at a country, what I call the Great Wall of a country, <laughs> along Summerhill Drive. Um, but, um, you know, American homes, you see them on TV. They do love their, their wide open spaces. There's no fencing between their lawns on their front yards. And their backyards are fenced in for sometimes, generally. Um, but in New Zealand, there's this increasing thing that everyone wants to build a, a, a fence in front of their house. You're permitted to build up to 1.6 metres, which means that um, on my height, that's just above my eyeball level <laughs> to see. Um, and when, when you can see that in expanse, of expanse after expanse, 
and I'm, I'm still surprised nobody's graffitied them <laughs> or in fact put murals on even mur <laughs> murals would do it better <laughs> so the new housing act the housing enabling act which is also going to have a massive impact upon housing design. This was passed in December 2021, just as everyone was packing up for Christmas. And if you want to point the finger at who made that decision, both National and Labor agreed to it, and ACT was the only ones who, dis who um, dissented. So, what is known as the three by three. So, um, under this new Housing Act, um, it is going to be possible to build um, three places on a single section that are up to three storeys high and resource consent will not be needed. The other aspect of that is that people will have no right to complain who are the neighbours next door. So this is one of the examples, the latest, mm, the sort of the bedded in one that was built about, opened about 2021, it's down my neck of the woods between Church and Pioneer Highway. It's called Harakeki Pa. I have to admit, it's been nicely thought about um, in the sense that um, it's, um, you know, each place has got a little bit of land and a little bit of a balcony to put things on. And, and um, but it is made by a developer who is providing social housing. And it seems that he's producing quite a lot of these for social housing. Um, so the three by three is becoming the is becoming the go-to for the Ministry of Social Developments, housing of people with no homes, whereas developers who are trying to sell homes, not rent them, the most that they've been daring enough to do in Palmerston is to go for a two-story terraced townhouse, corner of Ruahini and Gray Street. So, just one or two more things. Yes. Well, maybe. <laughs> Diversification. Uh, of course, um, the Town Planning Act brought in lots of zoning, uh, certain areas for certain activities. Nobody, of course, really wants an industrial warehouse right next door to them. But we now have businesses in the internet age that no longer have physical storage, um, need physical storage or stores. Rather, they warehouse their, their stock at home or in storage units and do online shopping. So you don't have a physical premise to go to. So in this case, which is just down the road, um, they're having, they've got um, built it to have two small shops. Well, a shop on the front, a graphics to studio on the back and living above the shop. So it's come back almost round to round to the days of Victorian era where you did live among the sh um, above the shop. Yeah, <laughs> we also have now the rising thing of um, people working from home, even if only for a few days a week. The other aspect, one thing, singletons. Twenty-five percent of our population now are single people who um, aren't the family standard family unit. What are we providing in terms of urban planning for those if we're not by building retirement villages? And then if we're going to have suburbs, what's going to be in the centre of our suburbs? Will there be a centre to a suburb? Um, in previous times, you would have had a school, a dairy, and a couple of essential businesses like a butcher or a greengrocer. This is the thing that's essential now in the centre of your suburb the bar, <laughs> the neighbourhood bar, the takeaway shop, and maybe an internet cafe for those who are now moving out to F um, WFH work from home. How much do people really want to feel like being part of a local community now? And my other thought is how far should a child have to travel to school? Is there, should a child be able to walk to their school. So that's just some of the um, questions I have to think about. The reason being is that, of course, I'm here as part of historic places. And in 20 years time, we're going to have to decide what's going to be typical or worthy of keeping 
listing from the 1980s. Those McMansions, the sausage flats of the 1970s, um, the fortress housing. And so what is our urban lifestyle going to come to look like? So I leave with um, this architect's comment. Suburbs promise openness, space and freedom, but they often fail to provide social facilities and community environments. Rich and varied cities need a full spectrum of residential possibilities if they are to be vibrant, satisfying and interesting. So in 20 years time, I'll report back and we'll see which ones we pick. <laughs> A hotel was painted four shades of blue as the super liquor man and we had the uh, telecom building on Main Street uh, being um, built along uh, with um, motels like Shades and the like and uh, there, there was a point where someone was proposing a buildings tour of Palmerston North to point out these these items from the, the, the 1980s which may or may not or not feature on future heritage things and it's uh, uh, interesting, I mean, we are talking about the impact of fire and people coming in on, on horses, it's because if we look out at Harvey Norman, um, that that used to be one or two stables used, used to be there. So if you were here 130 years ago, uh, you would have uh, could have got horses from one or two stables and just uh, behind us in Coleman Place was the first uh, fire station. Uh, built around 1883 or so. So uh, a number of the buildings that we, we take around, uh, uh, take for granted now have had a number of sort of previous uses and in incarnations, which is quite interesting to reflect on. Uh, so oh, that was on the corner. Yeah, yeah, that that, um, that was built about yes. So on the corner of Cuba Street and George Street. So that we. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there, there was there was that building and uh, that was next to the Odeon where we used to go along to when I was I was younger. Uh, so, uh, so our next speaker is. Uh, With the two minute break uh, about to occur, we will we all have that and then uh, we'll, we'll Mike Roche can talk about the uh, no.
Thank you. Right, about 40 years and two weeks ago, I got off the plane and walked along McGregor Street and I saw the houses at the end of the road there and they looked somewhat interesting and exotic. And uh, I also looked across and saw what I thought was Massey University. So I thought I'll walk and uh, I got there and it was the hospital. And uh, since then, I've understood a little bit more about the town, but um, I don't think I deserve expert status by any means. Um, Jeff said that I was going to talk as a historical geographer. So I'll just offer three thoughts. I do need to say something about the perspective from which I come. And I just want to talk a little bit about once I outline that, uh, the relationship between the built environment and local history, and thirdly, just um, add in a couple of other embellishments uh, about how, how I think we might do um, local studies. So the, the geographical hat I wear is one where I'm interested in the geography of the past, and it's called historical geography. It's a little bit of a, um, a, a hybrid, uh, I suppose we would say. Um, or a mongrel, um, that I have to um, ask geographical questions, but I have to often borrow the techniques that Jeff would use as a historian to, and, and the evidence that he would work with to try and answer those questions. So that's the, the perspective. The, the slide I chose was one to remind us that when we're talking about the built environment, we can talk about more than just housing. We can talk about a range of um, commercial, retail, um, industrial um, dwelling uh, buildings. Uh, I think we could extend it to include um, not very um, sexy sorts of things like infrastructure. Um, they're probably quite important at the moment, we would accept. Um, green spaces that are, are maintained, maybe to look naturalistic, but really are, are quite managed. And various sorts of symbolic and commemorative landscapes, you know, particularly war memorials. So built environment can be quite uh, quite expansive as a, as a heading, and I think we do need to remember that. The other thing with that particular photo it's supposed to remind me to say is that, that um, that's not there anymore. Yeah, it's gone. Um, so that sometimes uh, if, if we look out anywhere, there's a mix of, of ages and um, sometimes purposes. Um, and it's interesting to ask questions about what stays and what goes and why and the sorts of um, economic and social political processes that might um, push for certain things to be saved, certain things to to be uh, demolished or maybe to be um, refurbished or um, uh, what's the dreaded word, you know, facades are saved and the uh, the uh, box is built behind it. Um, so there's a number of things that, that happen there and it's interesting to um, think about those, the periodicity of them um, and the like. So if you walk around the square, you can mentally um, build up a little checklist of how old the different buildings are, for example. Um, the traces of the past environments sometimes are quite obvious in the form of, of buildings that maybe are over 100 years old. Sometimes they can be quite subtle, like the, the water trough at the bottom of Summerhill Drive that reminds us of the, the age of the horse, or either the age of the, uh, the car. We can also access the past by various sorts of photographs, maps and plans, newspapers, and also um, memory and oral tradition of various sorts. The, the sort of proposition I would put is that um, people create built environments, but uh, the built environment itself can offer some sort of subtle and not so subtle way sometimes uh, influence on us as the people who are in that particular uh, milieu. Sometimes it's uh, so subtle and sometimes it, it's not so subtle. Uh, I think also I would suggest that uh, all built environments have some sort of local dimension um, so that if, you, if you're interested in the built environment, probably at some point you need to at least nod your head to local history. But flipping around the other way, I don't think local history need necessarily have to engage very strongly with built environments. 
And thirdly, wearing my geographer's hat, I'd also suggest that local history and the built environment probably intersect um, in, in ways that are perhaps um, uh, not necessarily recognised by the uh, everyone. Yeah. Um, geographers clearly think they are important. Um, sometimes others may overlook them. The then the, the other spin-off point that would, would go to that is I think sometimes if you're looking at the uh, the scale at which histories are written from local through to regional or national or international sorts of studies, I think sometimes there's an implied hierarchy here and that the, the people who are working at the national or international scale are regarded as um, being worthy of having a pat on the head and those who are working at the local scale are, are deemed to be um, maybe the enthusiastic amateurs. And that's, I think, uh, misleading at, at a number of levels. I mean, we have the evidence of Jeff sitting behind me anyway, but over and above that, I think it's because we, you're thinking of a hierarchy from local to regional to national. If instead you think of it as some sort of um, more like uh, a fried egg, uh, with a set of concentric zones where local, regional, national, international are all sort of nested within each other, then um, you can see how the local can be connected to larger scales and vice versa. And you don't need to privilege one over the other. And you definitely don't need to then say that the only people who are interested in local history and the local built environment are, are keen and enthusiastic amateurs. because. They're not, and they need not be. The the other thing I'd mention, wearing my geographer's hat, is that field work can be uh, an essential part of built environment local history research, and it's often um, one of the more engaging and interesting bits. Uh, sometimes certain things only make sense when you look on the ground. Um, for example, I was doing some farming work out at Pahonga and um, I could see the maps that the surveyors had drawn of how the farmer had shaped the remaining bush on the, on the farm and it, there was a little circular uh, bit in the back paddock. And it wasn't until we went out there and actually saw that there was a spot and flat, it was a hill, good grief, and they had cleared the bush up to a certain point and left it. Then that what I was looking at just in the plain made much more sense. And I think there are other examples of that. Um, the other connection, if I just finish with this, is something that um, I was experiencing at first hand upstairs the last year or the year before. I had to give a talk about the Espinard and chose to talk about Peter Black, who was the first significant curator of the Espinard. And um, unbeknown to me, Peter Black Jr. was in the audience. And fortunately, Peter Black Sr. was a, um, a commendable uh, public servant and there was nothing you really wanted to say about him that, you know, you weren't um, worried about saying. But it did remind me that, you know, we are talking about um, real people and real people's forebears and that you need to... Um, Don't push the evidence too far, I guess, and um, don't judge actions of yesterday by the standards of today necessarily. So um, it, you can be frank, but you don't need to overdo it. Um, and in terms of ways of working, I don't think there's any particular one way to, to do built environment and local history research. Uh, but I think there's, there's two or three things that I would suggest that might be useful if you're, if you're doing this either formally or even just informally. Uh, you do need to establish some sort of context that um, the, the local history projects that you're interested in do not exist in isolation, um, but we can capitalise on other work that's been done on the city, for example, to help understand bits that maybe we don't understand very well. I think sometimes imitation is the highest form of flattery, that people have worked on related topics in other places, and I don't think we should hesitate um, in, in terms of 
seeing how they've worked and trying to borrow what might be useful and bring it across to um, work in Palmerston North setting. Um, and also with some sort of sense of triangulation that there are a number of different sources for um, the story you might be interested in. And if you can try and bring them all together, I think you can often get a, a clearer sense of points of agreement, points of disagreement. Um, there might not be one story there. There may be uh, one that conflicts at several points, and that may actually be the bigger story. So if I can end up just by saying that one of the first urban historical geographers in New Zealand, a guy called Lee Pownall, suggested that you could talk about New Zealand towns in terms of the functions, their origins relate to a particular function. He identified about 10 functions, if I just read them quickly, trade, colonial policy, mineral exploitation, accommodation, whaling, housing for agricultural estates, port functions, military operations, military missionary activities and health resorts, of which Palmerston North fits in his colonial policy group, um, along with trading uh, towns, colonial mining and accommodation. He reckons that some three quarters of all the towns in New Zealand uh, had that as their driving function. Um, and as um, Cindy said, this is a, a later establishment, 1860s inland, no navigable water, but largely in the presence of an open area in the forest. And in terms of some of the classic geographical models, um, allowing the um, Stuart um, surveys a grid. There is a, an element probably to the 1920s where um, there is some sort of classic concentric ring development here, essentially driven by land prices. Um, but there's also something of a sectoral model with the transport routes, with the city uh, having a railway line going through the middle of it, and some sort of uh, ribbon development also occurring. Um, and they um, probably lose impetus after 1953 when Town and Country Planning Act comes in. But that's really probably enough for me. Um, I think local history um, can sometimes um, be seen as a poor relation. Um, the built environment is clearly part of local history, although I'm not trying to suggest it's all of it. And I guess my other hidden plea is that when you're doing these studies in local history and, and the built environment, sometimes you're actually doing some quite good geographical work, even if you don't realise it. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you to all the panellists. Uh, we do have time now for questions, if, uh, if people have. Uh, yeah. Why the heck is the north, south, east, and west is? Um, it actually lies a little bit off skew. I know. Where the hell is that north? If you're standing in the square, where is north? <laughs> that way. Uh, what? Yeah, it's not that way. That way. If you look at the beauty. <laughs> If you, if you look where Tapiti is facing, he's facing east. If you, if you work off that, by the north. Naughty elephants work water. He's not I think he was probably also trying to lay that um, the main streets, um, the longest streets along the length of that um, clearing. No, he's yeah. not. Comment? No. Um, if you look at your map, it's not quite what he is doing. Ah, uh, uh, yes. It's a parallel characteristics. Otherwise, you would have a lot of mini San Francisco. Ah. Yes. <laughs> that way, sir. That's right. Well, sir. <laughs> it takes, takes a couple of bends. Yeah. Whenever I, I go out to Opiki and I find it very strange that the, the river is running uphill as far as I'm mm. concerned under the Opiki Bridge. 
um, keep expecting it to go that way. But anyway. I uh, yes, people got the bicycle, useful bicycles about 1890s, and um, it did really expand their range. And I've come across people who, in the even in the 1950s, would do something like cycle into town from Rongatia. Mm -hmm. um, so much further than we are prepared to do now. If there is a way to track the impact. You look at the marriage route, and when people can walk only, your courting distance is about an hour, three miles. <laughs> but once you get a bicycle, oh. you just make bigger, isn't it? It's probably about three times that. And someone's done an actual mm -hmm. survey on this. Yes. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not for pounds, not for foot on the route. <laughs> But it worked in the UK as well. Uh, yes, same. And, oh. It was to give it setback, if I remember, wasn't it? But they could. The pass side. Oh, but you mean the pass side? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Right, sorry. Oh, this is easier access. Also, it was an edge. They went beyond the actual limit. Oh, there was that too. Yeah, the river, the river has cut in and out yes. too, and so it did take away some of the front base of that. And, and that change in the river happened because. The old fella bachelor when he had very one. He was a bit of a sneaky bugger. What he what he mm -hmm. did was he actually pushed a whole lot of dirt river, pushed the river closer to the city. But there's actually a block of land there at no time. The negotiation. But what that did when he did that was change the course of the river, made it bend closer to total. And um we were talking about it before with the old cliff ranges that go along the front. What happened as the river came closer to the end of all of that. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, one was yeah. to build, the, they took the top off to build the river, also they took more off to build the And uh, Summerhill Drive, the road up Summerhill Drive. Yeah, so they, they didn't use the dirt, they just moved it elsewhere. There's the colouring yeah. again. Oh, but underneath the one, the, the bit that I don't understand, hiring your county. It's gifted to the patriotic society who then sell it, raise money. But also a gravel reserve. I'm not sure why the gravel reserve is taken away once. Within the I think we have to consult a city council lawyer about oh, that. Probably, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But the, the, at the time that that was being done, the folks at Fisher complained, weren't complaining about the noise of the community.
We have a we have a question over here. Again. The wrong, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm the wrong sort of geographer. Um, the, yeah, the some of the less up there is uh, if there's no water, it's very um, dry, almost like concrete. You go and look at my front garden in the, in the summer. Um, the difficulty is when some of it, when stuff gets exposed and water goes on it, then it can um, um, erode very, very quickly. Uh, I think there are some issues about how, slow, how comfortable you would be with building near the edge of things, and my comfort level is fairly fairly low, so I'm actually a long way away from the edge of anything up there. Um, if it floods, well, uh, we're probably up there with uh, plagues of locusts and everything else. Um, yeah, it, it's not very good farmland, so I can understand why some of the city um, I think as late as the 1970s, they were doing feasibility studies about going up in that direction. Um, I guess it's just how, how prudent you would want to be about um, having a good view, um, and it might be wise not to not to really want to be the one closest to the cliff face. It is. Um... They didn't build up there until the 1980s because of the extremely shallow, um, shall we say, spits of land onto which you could put the housing in between all those valleys um, that are there, which have now been um, turned into green space. So there was very little flat land as against the, um, the drops on each side. So the council didn't develop there for quite a while. Yeah. Going to have to be reconsidered yeah. and confront. The dreaded managed retreat. Um, managed retreat, he was mentioning. The dreaded. <laughs> so. Uh, are there any other questions? Oh, if not, can you join me in thanking our, our panellists for a very interesting discussion? And uh, thank you everyone for coming along and we hope to see you at uh, future events this week as part of Local History Week. And I think there will be another Local History Week uh, in November as well. So a very, very good year indeed for on the local history front. So.